why I'm happy, so I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. And when I meet the scoffers who ask me where they are, I say, my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood on the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. T'was at the old time altar where God came in my heart, and now my sins are gone. The Lord took full possession, the devil did depart. I'm glad my sins are gone. They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. When Satan comes to tempt me and tries to make me doubt, I say, my sins are gone. You got me into trouble, but Jesus got me out. I'm glad my sins are gone. There underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary, as far removed as darkness is from dawn. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. In the sea of God's forgetfulness, that's good enough for me. Praise God, my sins are gone. Take your Bible this morning for our scripture reading to Isaiah chapter 9. Again, please, Isaiah chapter 9. <clears throat> we have in each of these Sundays in December talked about the titles given here to the Son of God, the prophecy that Isaiah gave that his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and the Prince of Peace. And today will be the Prince of Peace. And so we'll read verses 6 and 7 together as we have this month. And as we normally do, let's all stand together to read the scripture, Isaiah 9 and verses 6 and 7, <clears throat> reading them together in unison. Ready? For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace." Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here today. Pray God that you will. Put your hand of blessing upon the special as it's sung once again this morning, this song that talks about our Savior and what a wonderful Savior He is. And I pray that it would cause all of us to focus upon Him, and I pray that He will be lifted up in the song and in our message again this morning. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Bethlehem Calvary, all of it tell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Mountain and plain with his praises shall swell. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost. Wonderful, glorious, oh, what a Savior is mine. There on the cross where he died for my sin, oh, 
what a Savior is mine, giving his life up for wonder to win. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Unto the uttermost. Wonderful, glorious, oh, what a Savior is mine. Rising again in his infinite grace, oh, what a Savior is mine. Shedding upon me the light of his face. Oh, what a Savior is mine, lifting my burdens, relieving my care. Oh, what a Savior is mine, giving me courage to do and to dare. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Sing that chorus with me. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior is mine. Oh, to the uttermost wonderful glorious oh what a savior is mine amen well you could almost say amen and go home don't get your hopes up It isn't going to happen, amen? Father, we thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful Savior you provided for us in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray now for your help as we open up your word together and look at it again at this wonderful prophecy of Isaiah. That unto us a child is born and unto us a son is given. That his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. The mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And I pray, God, you would help each one as they listen this morning. I pray that they would be spirit-filled listeners. And I would ask you to help me to be a spirit-filled preacher this morning. And that your truth would be proclaimed today from your word. And you would use it in the hearts and lives of every listener here this morning. May you be pleased with what's said and done in this place. And we'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The Great Chicago Fire occurred in 1871. 300 people died. Over 100,000 were left homeless. Events like that and tragedies like that always bring out some heroes. One of the heroes during that great Chicago fire was a man named Horatio Gates Spafford. He was an attorney, and he lost a lot of real estate in the fire. To make matters even worse, his son died about that same time. But in spite of that personal loss, Spafford went about helping others who were homeless and grief-stricken because of the fire. And because of his generosity and his service, he became rather well known throughout Chicago as a sincere and devout Christian. It was about two years later, November of 1873, when Spafford and his family decided they would take a vacation. Now, H.G. Spafford was a friend of D.L. Moody, 
and his family decided they would meet Moody in one of his evangelistic campaigns over in London, England. From then, the, from there, the family would travel on to Europe. However, just before they were supposed to leave, Horatio was unexpectedly detained by some business concerns in Chicago. And so the decision was made that his wife Anna and their four daughters would go ahead to England and he would catch up with them as soon as possible. But he didn't know that tragedy was to strike on that trip. Just off Newfoundland, the ship collided with an English sailing vessel and sunk within 20 minutes. His wife, Anna Spafford, was one of 47 passengers that survived. Tragically, included in the 226 who died were all four of their daughters. Anna Spafford's heartbreaking telegram to her husband was simply this, two words, saved alone. The grieving father immediately set sail for England to join his grief-stricken wife. As the ship he was traveling on passed the approximate location where his daughters had drowned, Horatio Spafford penned the words to a song we sing quite often. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well. It is well with my soul. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed His own blood for my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. I know this, I know the peace that Horatio Spafford enjoyed that day or that he experienced that day was not a peace that the world would give him. It's a peace that only comes from the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ. John chapter 14. Would you turn there with me please? The Gospel of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Fourth book of the New Testament. John 14. I would like to look at what Jesus said to His disciples as He's preparing them for Him to go away. Jesus says, John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace that only comes from God. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. And He lived that way when He was on earth. You never find Jesus Christ with frustration. You never find Him being short. You never find Him getting upset and saying something He shouldn't have said and having to apologize to someone later, like we sometimes do. After 40 days of fasting, he's in the desert being tempted by the devil himself, but he doesn't lose his peace, doesn't lose his cool, doesn't get upset. How are, how are you when you're tried and tested? Some of you, it doesn't take 40 days of fasting, it just takes the little time in the morning before you have your first cup of coffee. We're different, aren't we? I see him in a boat on the, on the Sea of Galilee. He can fall asleep in the midst of a storm. Perfectly at peace. Though everything was chaos around him. And I got to ask myself, how do I react in the storm? How do I handle myself in the storm? How are you in the storms of life? 
when he had knowledge of Lazarus' death, he stayed in the same place for two days. In fact, he told his disciples that Lazarus sleeps, but I'm going to go that I can wake him up. He seemed pretty calm about it all. Didn't seem to be too panicked about anything. Let me ask you a question. How are, how are you in the presence of death? How do you handle the death of someone whom you love? Because Jesus loved Lazarus. When he faced the demoniac of Gadara, possessed with demons, we don't know how many. The Bible doesn't say. We do know when they asked leave to get out, Jesus said they could go out and go into the herd of pigs. 2,000 of them ran over the cliff and were drowned into the sea. You can imagine if you were one person possessed with possibly 2,000 demons. But Jesus comes across these demons and here's a man who had no peace whatsoever. The Bible says he lived in the tombs. He lived in the cemetery and he was always running about cutting himself and yelling and screaming. Oh, the people tried to help him. They came out and tried to put chains and fetters on him. Try to keep him from hurting himself. But he would add none of it. He would break them like they were pieces of paper. Consequently, everybody was afraid of him. Nobody wanted to come close to him. He was a maniac. Nowadays, you just put a guitar around his string and put him on a stage and he makes millions of dollars. Yelling and screaming. Cutting himself. But that's another message. Do you understand how terrified they were, but Jesus wasn't. He was as calm as could be. And, and once the demons were out, and everybody, the word spread what had happened, they all came out to see what was done, and they saw this wild man, this man who was always running around, never sitting down, never calm, never peaceful, and where did they find him? Sitting, clothed, and at the feet of Jesus. Wow. Peace. Peace. Why was he at peace? Because the Prince of Peace was there. The Prince of Peace was there. Quite remarkable, isn't it? It's a supernatural thing. But I see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Soldiers come to arrest him. What did Peter do? Grab my sword and cut off somebody's I wanted to cut his head off, but I'm not too good of a swordsman. I'm a fisherman. And I missed and I just got an ear. Jesus didn't panic. Jesus reached down, picked up the guy's ear and put it back on his head. I don't know about you, but if I'm a Roman soldier, I'd just say, I'm done. I'm out of here. If that guy can do that, I'm not arresting this guy. <laughs> but always peace. Always peace. He goes from court to court and from ruler to ruler, facing the lies and the slander and the trumped up charges. He was afflicted. He was oppressed. And yet, as the Bible says, he opened not his mouth. As a lamb led to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shears is dumb, is quiet. So he opened not his mouth. They marveled at him. Because most men defend themselves. Most men will get adamant and agitated that they're being lied about. But Jesus had peace. He answers not a word. Even when He hung on the cross, they came by, they mocked Him. Yeah, you saved others. Save yourself. Jesus never answered a word. In fact, He said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Peace. That, that peace is just beyond comprehension. Peace that is unspeakable. Peace that only comes from Jesus Christ. The angels said something when he was born. They said, they told the shepherds, on earth, 
peace, goodwill toward men. We, we change that and just say peace on earth, goodwill towards men. No, they were saying on earth, comma, peace. The prince of peace is now on earth. Goodwill towards men. It's a whole different meaning than what we say, than we turn it around to be. He is the peace. Remember when he came to Martha and Mary after the death of Lazarus? And, and she said, he asked Martha, I believe, do you believe your brother will live again? And Martha said, I believe he'll live in the resurrection day. And that last day, and Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He's saying, Martha, the resurrection isn't a day. The resurrection's not an event. The resurrection's a person. And it's me. It's Jesus Christ. Hey, peace isn't something you're looking for. It's not something that happens. It's someone who you know. Peace is Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ, He's the Prince of Peace. Three truths I want to give you this morning. Number one is this. Christ gives us peace with God. Christ gives us peace with God. Romans 5 and verse 1. Would you look there with me please? Romans 5 and verse 1. Here Paul writes to the Romans and he says this, verse 1, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Peace with God. There's a peace in my heart that the world never gave. A peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come there to stay. Constantly abiding. Constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. Yes, Jesus is mine. And He made peace between me and God. Peace between me and a holy God. In his book, Hidden in Plain Sight, Pastor Mark Buchanan writes about a woman named Regine. Originally from Rwanda, Regine came to Christ while reading her sister's Bible during the genocide that ravaged her country. When she fled to Canada for refuge, she met her husband, Gordon. They decided to return to Rwanda to show the love of Christ to the people who had once been her enemies. This is a story Regine told to Mark Buchanan. Quote, a woman's only son was killed. She was consumed with grief and hate and bitterness. God, she prayed, reveal to me my son's killer. One night she dreamed that she was going to heaven. But there was a complication. She said to get to heaven, she had to pass through a certain house. She had to walk down the street, enter the house through the front door, go through, its, go through its rooms, up the stairs, and exit through the back door. She said, God, whose house is this? God, she said, God told me it's the house of your son's killer. The road to heaven passes through the house of your enemy. It was two nights later, she's telling the story, it was two nights later, there's a knock at her door. She opened it, and there stood a young man who was about her son's age. Yes, he hesitated. Then he said, I am the one who killed your son. Since that day, I have had no life, no peace. So here I am. I am placing my life in your hands. Kill me. I'm dead already. Throw me in jail. I'm in prison already. Torture me. I'm in torment already. Do with me as you wish. The woman had prayed for that day. And now it had arrived and she did not know what to do. But she found to her own surprise that she did not want to kill him. Or throw him in jail. Or torture him. In that moment of reckoning, she said, I only wanted one thing, a son. I ask this of you, she said. 
Come into my home and live with me. Eat the food I would have prepared for my son. Wear the clothes I would have made for my son. Become the son that I lost. And so he did. Do you realize that's what God did for you and me? We killed his son. No, it was those Romans and those Jewish rulers. No, 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 no. It was my sin and your sin that was put on Jesus Christ. God commended or demonstrated His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He, God, hath made Him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. See, it was our sin that killed Him. It was our sin that put Jesus on the cross. But when we come to Him and we confess that sin, and we, we put our faith in His Son, our, uh, Jesus Christ as our Savior, instead of killing us, instead of torturing us, instead of throwing us in prison, He lets us be called His children. We become His sons and daughters. But as many as received Him, that's Jesus, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Peace with God. It's a wonderful thing to have peace with God. But it only comes through Jesus Christ. It's the only way you get peace. You can try everything else, it won't last this world will try to satisfy that deep longing in your soul. You'll search the whole world over, but you'll be just as before. You'll never find true satisfaction until you found the Lord. For only Jesus can satisfy your soul. That's the peace you're looking for. I wish you could hear. I wish sometime we could get a recording something to record the testimonies of some of the men who we minister to in prison. And they stand up and testify of the peace that they have in their heart and the peace they have in their life. Even though they're behind barbed wire. Even though they're in a confinement situation. Them to stand up and say, I'm freer now than I ever have been in my life. That's because of the Prince of Peace. Peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you have peace with God this morning? No, it's not through a church. Look at, uh, tur turn over with me to Colossians chapter 1, will you please? Colossians chapter 1. You're in Romans, you go past 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then you'll meet Colossians. If you get to Thessalonians, back up. Colossians 1. And notice verse 20 with me. The Bible says, And having made, what church? Peace. How did He make peace? Through the blood of His cross. By Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. By Him, I say, whether there be things on earth, are things in heaven. And you, that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled. I've been reconciled. I've been brought back to God. How? By the blood that Jesus shed on the cross for my sin. But for your sin. That's the only way you can have peace with God. There's no other way. He's the Prince of Peace. He'll give you peace with God. But there's another peace that I want to talk to you about this morning. For you can have peace with God, but be lacking this peace in your Christian life. And that is the peace of God. You can have peace with God and yet not enjoy something that the Lord calls the peace of God. Look at Philippians. You're in Colossians just to your left. Philippians chapter 4. 
Do you notice verse number 6? Be careful for nothing. That means don't be full of care about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And then what happens? And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Christ not only gives us peace with God, He gives us the peace of God. Now that happens when we are not anxious or careful about anything, but we commit everything to Him. Where we say, He sits on the throne of my heart. Everything in my life is yielded to His control. Not my control. You probably undoubtedly at some time in your life have seen the bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. That's not where God intends to be. God is the pilot. Somebody said, well, if God's your co-pilot, switch seats. Well, that's a good thing. But I don't even think He needs me to be the co-pilot. I think He can handle it all by Himself. He doesn't need my help. when I finally come to the point where I say, Lord, I'm, I'm not doing it my way. You can be saved. You can have peace with God and still be living your life your way. And still doing what you want and what you think and what you feel instead of what God wants and what God thinks and what God feels. You can live your life. And listen, the vast majority of people that come in on Friday night to our addictions program or we meet in prison that are there uh, having broken the law or been involved with some addiction. Listen, by and large, many of them are professing Christians. They have peace with God, but they do not know the peace of God. Because they've never come to a point in their life where they said, okay, I, listen, I've done it my way this long and this hasn't. Look what it's got me. Why don't I do it God's way? Why don't I let God have control? Why don't I in everything by prayer and supplication let my request be known unto God? That means everything I turn over to Him. And you know when that happens the peace of God comes and it keeps my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. There's a peace that comes. It's the peace of Go to the Old Testament, to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah 26. This is a verse you ought to have marked in your Bible anyway. Isaiah 26. Notice what he says here in verse number 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because... He trusteth in thee. That's the, that's the peace that he's talking about in Philippians 4. The peace that passes all understanding. And you get that perfect peace by keeping your mind stayed on Christ. Fixed on Him. Because you're trusting in Him. You're leaning on Him. You're relying on Him. Jesus said, it's the peace that I give you that dwells in you. Christ dwells in our heart by faith. So He lives in here. And His peace lives in here. The peace of God doesn't come from what's happening out here. It comes from who lives in here. When, when things happen, and, and it happens to everybody, unexpected death and tragedy or difficulties that our life faces and, and things that happen in relationships that go bad and, and, and we get all worked up about it. We say, oh, I just can't sleep. Oh, i I, I got to take a pill. i got to sleep. Wait a minute. Where's your peace? Where's Jesus Christ? I'm told in Isaiah 9 and verse 6 that that word for Prince of Peace there is the same word from which we get our word, tranquilizer. I just need something to calm me down. What does the world say? I got to have something to calm me down. Give me a drink. I got to have something to calm me down. 
give me a few minutes alone with Jesus. Where's your Christianity? Where's your faith? Who dwells in you? Who are we relying on? You know, sometimes when we say don't conform to the world, we like all the obvious stuff, but we don't think about these situations. How do I respond? in difficult situations when there's chaos all around me. Where's the peace come from? Hmm? Horatio Spafford didn't say, give me something to keep me calm, Doc. I just lost four children. No. He had the peace of God that passes all understanding. He went to the Lord with it. You cannot have that peace apart from Jesus Christ. It's impossible. He's the Prince of Peace. And it'll resolve situations and circumstances and relationships. It'll bring peace to our inner heart and mind. You know, when Jesus spoke those words about my peace give I unto you, not as the world gives. Don't let your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He spoke those words just days before He's going to be crucified. Just days before He knew what He was going to go through. Suffering for our sins. He's trying to to show them, fellas, if I'm not troubled and I'm not afraid and I have the peace because I'm the Prince of Peace, you can too. And we, you and I can also. It depends on whether the indwelling Prince of Peace is ruling in your heart or not. You can tell who's ruling in your heart by how you react in difficult situations. Two artists set out to paint a picture representing perfect peace. The first scene, the first artist created a, a depicted a carefree schoolboy sitting in a boat on a quiet lake not a ripple to disturb the surface. The second artist painted a raging waterfall spewing out its spray in every direction. But above the waterfall, on a limb overhanging the swirling water, a bird sat quietly on her nest. That won the prize for peace. Not... The Lord never said, in fact, He said, in this world you'll have tribulation, you'll have trouble. God doesn't isolate us and insulate us from problems and struggles and it rains on the just and the unjust. We all go through struggles, we all go through trials. But there's something different because of what's on the inside for a believer. Not what's on the inside, who's on the inside. Jesus dwells within. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the Prince of Peace. An elderly woman was badly crippled by arthritis. And she was asked, do you suffer much? And she said, yes, but there's no nail here. She pointed to her hand and said, he had nails. I have peace. She pointed to her head and said, there's no thorns here. He had thorns but I have peace. She touched her side and said, there's no spear here. He had the spear. I have the peace. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Let me ask you a question this morning. Do you have peace in your life? I hope you have peace with God by your faith in Jesus Christ. But now a second question. Do you have the peace of God? That only comes when you bow the knee and say, Jesus Christ, you be the ruler in my life. You set up your government in me. You're the ruler. And let Him reign in your life. Let Him have full control. That's when you get the peace of God. But the third thing I want to share with you in closing is this. Christ also give us peace with others. Now I want you to look at the book of Ephesians, would you please? Ephesians chapter 2. Are you okay? You can put your tray tables in the upright position. We'll be coming in for a landing soon. Ephesians 2. Verse 
It's only Jesus Christ and Him giving us peace that allows us to have right relationships with others, to forgive others, and to be able to love our enemies. In Ephesians 2, verse 12, it says that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Without Christ, we're in bad shape. There's nothing worse than those two words, no hope. Without Christ, there's no hope for you. There's no, there's no encouragement I can give you this morning if you're without Jesus Christ. So we're in bad shape. We're far away from God, without God in the world. But now, verse 13, in Christ Jesus, that's when you have your faith in Christ, ye who were sometimes far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man, so making peace. Now in this particular passage, He's emphasizing to the church at Ephesus that God is is not making a difference anymore once you're in Christ between Jew and Gentile, between bond and free. He said there's no difference now. Those walls are broken down. Those divisions are no longer there. Christ has taken that away. There's peace between other people. Listen to me. There's tensions in America. There's tensions between the the races. Tensions between whether people are American or not American, or whether they're black or white, or whether they're in 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 some t- some cases whether they're considered rich or poor. By the way, in America, we're all rich. You ask ninety five percent of the world, and we're rich. But listen, how, what's the answer? Say, man, you know Rodney King from twenty seven years ago or whatever. Can't we all just get along? You know what's missing? What's missing is the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ. We threw God out and said, we don't want God. We don't want the Bible. We don't want Jesus Christ. You're not going to have peace. Won't happen. He is the one that makes us love our neighbor as ourselves. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Then you can love your neighbor as yourself. He's the one who takes care of that. He brought us not just to reconcile us to God, but able to reconcile us with one another. That we would love our fellow man. We would love each other as Christ loved us. In the 1950s, the world was shocked when five missionaries were killed trying to reach the Aka Indians with the gospel. Later, the tribe welcomed the wife of one of the martyred missionaries, Elizabeth Elliot, and the sister of another one of the murdered men into their community. That's when the translation on a New Testament for that tribe began to happen. But translators had a difficult time putting the word reconciled into the Aka language. They searched and searched for an equivalent word, but they couldn't find one. How can we convey the word reconciled to the people? But one day they were traveling through the jungle with some of the Aka Indians And they came to a narrow, deep ravine. And the missionary thought they could go no farther, but the Aukas took out their machetes, cut down a large tree so that it fell over the ravine, permitting them to cross safely. And the translator, listening to the Aukas speak, discovered they had a word for the tree across the ravine. And it was the word they'd been looking for to express the word reconcile. When Jesus died on the cross, that old rugged cross is our tree across the ravine. 
to reconcile us to God. It, pro, it, it bridges the, the, the ravine, the chasm that separates us from God, and by the way, can separate us from each other. What the cross could not do in demanding peace and love, the cross of Christ does for those who put their faith in Him. You know, when you put your faith in Christ, we tell this to the prisoners, God begins to change you, but God always changes you from the inside out. God always begins His work inside and works outward. And, 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 and because what's on the inside will show on the outside. It eventually is going to get there. And it's a process and it takes some time. You grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And when He puts peace in your heart, you know what it does? It makes it possible to love people who you used to hate. I, I remember we had a fellow in church years ago and he's in heaven now. Uh, Brother Kenny Nealon, and uh, gave the testimony how, you know, every time we had a testimony, he would give his testimony and talk about how, you know, it's just amazing. He said, you all are the people I used to make fun of. I used to make fun of you born-again Christians. And now I am one. I used to make fun of people who went to church all the time, and now I go to church all the time. See? It, what, what, what's changed him? Jesus Christ changed him. And Jesus Christ can change you. He's the Prince of Peace. Charles Schultz, the creator of the Peanuts cartoon, had a cartoon once with Lucy saying to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole wide world. And Charlie Brown said, but I thought you had inner peace. Lucy says, I do have inner peace, but I still have outer obnoxiousness. <laughs> Can I tell you this? When Jesus gives you the inner peace, He takes away the outer obnoxiousness. Okay, He takes away the bitterness. He takes away the anger. He takes away the things that plague so many, many Christians. Trust Jesus Christ to forgive your sins. Put your faith in Him that He died for you and that you'll trust Him as your Savior. And you have peace with God. Let Him reign in your life. Say, okay, it's not my life anymore, it's yours. I bought with a price. I'll live as you want me to live. I'll do what you want me to do. Lord, you're in control of my life. And you'll find the peace of God comes in. And He'll rule and reign in your heart. And then you'll have peace with others as well. He's the Prince of of peace. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. Watch it. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. Oh, what a day, glorious day, that will be. Sing it. Oh, what a day that will be, oh, and by Jesus I shall see. And I look upon His face, the one who saved me by His grace. When He takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land. What a day, glorious day that will be. I hope you'll be part of that. Let it, listen, if you've never received Christ, why don't you have peace with God today? you have peace with God and you don't have the peace of God, yield to Him today. Put Him on the throne of your heart and say, you are in charge. You, you set up the government in my life. And He'll give you the peace of God and the peace with others around you. He's the Prince of Peace. Father, thank You for this morning. Thank You, Lord, for everyone's attention today. Thank You for the wonderful Prince of Peace You've sent our way. 
Not just that we read about, not just that we look at in the Scripture, but He lives in our heart. Christ dwells in our heart by faith. And Lord, I pray that everyone in this room can testify to say they have peace with God. I pray that everyone in the room can, would be able to say, I will yield to Christ and allow the Prince of Peace to rule and reign in my heart. That I'll commit everything to Him. I'll not be careful, full of care, or anxious about anything. I will trust Him with everything. And let the peace of God keep my heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And it will give me the peace with others that I seek. Most conflict with others is a lack of peace within ourselves.